I'm pleased to be joined today by Dr. Courtney Hilton. He is a cognitive scientist and postdoctoral research fellow at the Music Lab at Harvard University. Courtney, welcome to the Nature and Nurture podcast. Thank you. It's a yeah, pleasure to be here. Thank you. So Courtney, you started off doing music full time before you went into cognitive science. Is that right? Yeah. So um, I guess I had like yeah, a bit of an atypical path into where I am now as a cognitive scientist you know, in a psychology department, um, as, as you said, I sort of started out in music. Um, so I initially trained to become a musician, um, back in Australia. So, you know, I'm, I'm from Australia. Um, and, uh, you know, to cut a long story short, um, you know, I, I sort of play a variety of different music and, um, a couple of different instruments, but my main instrument was the classical guitar. And I, um, actually trained to become a classical guitarist, um, you know, for a while, um, uh, you know, really kind of having that as my primary passion and goal and kind of had a sense that I was going to, uh, you know, eventually you know, become a musician. And then I guess my intellectual curiosity kind of got the better of me and um, uh, kind of diverted my path in, in, you know, in a way that I didn't necessarily see coming, but in retrospect, um, you know, it's been a enjoyable ride to go from, initially becoming a musician to slowly sort of discovering my passion for cognitive science and you know psychology and these sorts of things um and eventually you know i did my phd um in essentially a cognitive science topic at the university of sydney looking at the sort of cognitive role rhythm plays in um how we understand speech and language um yeah and that's like kind of how i ended up Sort of falling into cognitive science and where i am now um i get to really focus on that sort of connection with music and uh you know understanding music from a cognitive perspective yeah when you were doing music full-time before your phd did you know anything about the science of musical cognition not a great deal um at, at least not at first so um i mean I, i've always been really interested in science and i guess like i would have been roughly exposed to like a few maybe general popular science things to do with music, but not a great deal. And actually my initial kind of forays into sort of cognitive science and psychology was actually through my um, other interest, which is in the science of learning and education and like, you know, how can we improve how we teach people based on like how their minds work and, and this sort of thing. Um, and so I became, um, uh, quite involved with a few sort of cognitive science labs, uh, especially at the University of Sydney, um, people like Professor Michael Jacobson and um, uh, Professor Micah Goldwater, um, who, you know, like study the science of learning. And that was kind of my initial, you know, uh, starting point of my fascination with this area. And then I eventually kind of brought back that kind of theoretical methodological perspective from the cognitive sciences back to my kind of passion for music and mm -hmm. You know trying to understand that so were you double majoring classical guitar and psychology no so like yeah again like my my path was quite uh untraditional in that i didn't have any undergraduate training in psychology so. i just ask because not everyone finds themselves in a lab it's like something you usually go really out of your way for right yeah and, and that's that's very much true and so i guess i uh purely kind of by chance and just being at the right place at the right time ended up being involved in some labs that did this work and um yeah like one thing led to another and luckily you know some of these professors there so especially like um you know uh, micah goldwater like really kind of um supported my initial kind of um you know fascination with this topic and you know exposed me to a lot of this literature and that ideas and you know you know really welcomed me into that sort of intellectual community at the university which um yeah mm -hmm. yeah we we talk a lot about well nature and nurture on this show like the, the different socio-cultural versus like ge genetic and biological influences on people's interests and behavior and i'm wondering to to what extent that passion for music and, and e even for wanting to understand how the mind works how much of that might be innate versus uh st stuff that you're exposed to from a young age yeah like i mean these sort of things like um it's hard to uh 
think too much about super specific cases, um, but certainly there's, you know, like with a lot of these sorts of things, there's going to be a mix of kind of more or less, um, you know, non-experiential components that we can maybe put on the nature side of things that shape someone's interests and eventual paths but then of course a lot of things on the experiential side of things yeah I guess certainly like you know I, I've always been a very sort of curious um intellectually kind of person mm -hmm. and for whatever reason kind of un unafraid to jump into new intellectual domains to kind of you know try and <laughs> see what I can learn from them yeah um, are you familiar with any of Asal Habibi's work uh, only vaguely yeah uh -huh. She runs a, a music neuroscience lab at USC, and oh, yes. she there, there's one cool study that she's doing, um, taking a whole bunch of kids and some and enrolling them in these free after school programs. So one group, a large group, is taking music lessons with the LA uh, Harmonic Orchestra, and mm -hmm. and then the other group they still get something, but they're doing like sports or something that isn't music. So the, the, the goal is to look at how music specifically is different from other sorts of enriching activities. And they find that over time, the kids' brains actually change. Um, stuff in the auditory cortex, they become more adept at, at perceiving all these musical cues. And then also with violinists specifically, um, their motor cortex changes too, because you have to have like all, you know, your fingers have to be very precise. And, and usually it's the left hand, right? So even, even right-handed kids, um, Normally, normally you see them more skilled with their right hand, but the violinists uh, seem seem to be more. Um, what's the term for for being There's, by handed? Uh, yeah, right. Yeah. And like violinists, you kind of got this asymmetry between you know one hand's doing a very different thing to the other hand. And um, uh -huh. yeah, yeah, so that that seems to be more like typically neuroscience focused and development focused. But your work focuses on on the more cognitive aspects of how we actually perceive sounds and and stuff like that, right? Yeah, um, although my work does sometimes do some things in the neurosciences, you know, for mm -hmm. example, my PhD, I did a number of um, like EEG or uh, electroencephalography experiments. Um, uh, but, you know, the, the sorts of things you were just talking about um, get into one of the kind of big topics in the sciences of learning, this idea of transfer or transfer effects, um, uh -huh. which, which is like, you know, basically this phenomenon where like, you know, is doing something like music, are you just learning skills or developing certain capacities that are just relevant to music? Or is there some extent of transfer to other domains that aren't music? And, and so this is something that's like kind of fascinated people and has been quite attractive for kind of, I don't know, science funders and this sort of thing for, for a little while. Um, I'm always in like two minds uh, about this kind of research. I think there's definitely, um, some claims made in this space and certainly supported by you know sometimes popular media and such that perhaps mm -hmm. make too stronger claims um, than what is really justified by the data so you know sometimes there's this idea thrown around that you know by um, engaging in music by doing music lessons and all those sorts of things you're you're like you know turning your kid into a little genius or something like that like it's going to yeah. um, make them smarter and you know um while there were some initial studies that might have been interpreted as showing maybe evidence for that sort of thing earlier on, I think the current literature is a little bit more skeptical as um, as to some of those like general effects. Uh, no doubt, like doing something like music changes your brain, like just about anything we do, um, you know, our brain in at least some small way uh, changes in response to our experiences. Um, but uh, yeah, um, and but I, I would say there are a few domains that I'm particularly interested in with regards to transfer effects that I think are perhaps a little bit more um, uh, robust in the current literature. Um, so for example, I think there are really interesting relationships between um, uh, you know, musical engagement from a young age and uh, certain speech and language abilities. Um, so like, you know, for instance, um, uh, that there are some labs such as Raina Gordon's lab at Vanderbilt University that do a lot of work in this space, um, among a number of others, um, that kind of, yeah, explores this idea that um, the, there might be interesting relationships between the kinds of rhythm skills you might learn in music and um, certain kind of speech and, uh, you know, 
language abilities. And one thing that I'm quite interested in and have had a few collaborations on actually, um, and some ongoing projects is, you know, for example, with um, children's with uh, children with speech disorders and such things like can musical training kind of like exercises actually end up helping address some of the um, uh, some of their issues with speech mm -hmm. production. Um, right. Right. Music does seem to go through like a different pathway than language, right? Because sometimes you have, um, I, I don't remember the technical term, but there are people that have some sort of speech impediment and they, they can't speak fluently, but they could sing fluently. Yeah, so this is like an interesting phenomenon. Um, uh, Right. And, and, and so like the, the neurobiology of speech and language is like a kind of um, a big kind of complex topic. Um, and certainly it is true that is, um, uh, you know, a number of areas that are kind of maybe you, you might call them like distinct pathways for, um, you know, speech and music. But of course, there's a lot of shared um, uh, neural machinery as well. Um, you know, at some level, speech and music involve, you know, these complex coordination of sounds and social relationships and sort of like some sort of sense of communication. Um, so there's a lot in common while well, simultaneously there are like interesting differences. So for example, with music, we tend not to communicate the same sorts of information we do when we're speaking, right? You know, like I, I wouldn't just like whistle a melody to you in response to the questions you're giving me, um, for instance. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, like, the, and, and, and there is like this idea that like some of these people with apraxia of speech, some of these people with um, uh, challenges with like typical speech um, can often find uh, singing as something that kind of, in le at least in some circumstances, bypasses some of the difficulties they might otherwise have with speech. Um, and similarly, uh, you know, for, for example, some people with um, challenges relating to stuttering and this sort of thing can often find rhythmic structure and kind of like almost like kind of singing their speech or being particularly mindful of the rhythm of their speech can actually also help them, um, you know, speak more fluently without stuttering. Uh -huh. I, I knew someone who had a stutter in regular speech but could do accents and when he took on the accents he would be able to, to speak in that accent um, without any stutter. So that seems to be something almost in between regular speech and, and music when you're taking yeah. on this different tone. Yeah, that's an interesting idea. Like, uh, certainly, yeah, I, I'm no expert on that, on the specifics of like, you know, how people engage with accents, but um, yeah, it's certainly like the, the, the kinds of people that can do accents well, similar like with music, you have to be so kind of sensitive to these like little acoustic nuances and be able to control your, um, you know, your vocal production apparatus uh, in such a precise way to, um, you know, imitate all these different accents. Um, we we kind of take it for granted, actually, how easy it is to speak, um, because it's what most of us do um, uh, so effortlessly. But of course, there's many people that have difficulties doing that. And of course, um, you know, when we actually study the neural mechanisms and such of speech, it actually turns out to be, you know, highly complex. And, you um, yeah, so I wonder at all that, you know, humans have evolved to be able to speak so uh, fluently and flexibly right. the way we can. Okay, so that, br that brings up a related question of how, whether we evolved for, like, or for, uh, for music or not. I've heard arguments on both sides, some people saying that perhaps music evolved as a form of social bonding or even for courtship, like a lot of birds do. And then other people say, like, it's just an artifact for language. As soon as we learn to speak, music is just a byproduct of that. Yeah, so... Um... I guess, yeah, so th this is like a big debate in the field. And actually there was recently a, um, uh, a big issue in the journal Behavioral and Brain Sciences that kind of looked at this question where um, there was one paper and slash group of people talking about this kind of social bonding origin story of, um, of, of music. And then uh, another group of people, including my uh, current director of the lab I'm part of, um, Samuel Mir, he, he led a group or was part of a group of um, people that uh, proposed a somewhat similar but different proposal uh, relating to something called credible signaling. Perhaps it's not worthwhile getting into the exact nitty gritty details of that now. Um, but so th this is a fascinating debate. And kind of like you said, on the one side, there are some people that suggest that like perhaps we didn't evolve the music and it's just, you know, something that um, 
just falls out of our like you know complex brains and our ability to speak and all of this sort of thing already um famously uh, uh the cognitive psychologist Steven Pinker you know suggested the idea of auditory cheesecake um this idea that um you know music is something that uh kind of like cheesecake we didn't evolve to like cheesecake but we did you know potentially evolve the kind of desire to um be attracted towards like you know these high energy foods like you know sugars and fats in concentration um and uh you know as a result of that we you know happen to in general be attracted to cheesecakes although many people don't like cheesecake so that's a whole different story i like but, that analogy yeah so that's that's a nice analogy um and uh you know, also one of my great intellectual heroes, um, William James, uh, the kind of um, foundational psychologist and philosopher, he kind of postulated that music might be something that perhaps wasn't evolved and not really specialized and just like fell out of our existing capacities as, um, you know, um, sophisticated, you know, animals that are capable of, you know, all sorts of other things. Um, but at the same time, uh, I think there are some convincing arguments in favor of the idea that there might be at least some adaptations for music. So, um, and, and this is also an old idea. So Charles Darwin, for example, uh, postulated a number of ideas and talked about this, um, especially in his, you know, 1871 book, like The Descent of Man. Um, and, you know, like, so, so he, he was popular for, um, uh, you know, putting forward the idea that there might be some sort of like sexual selection idea similar to uh, what is known for at least some bird species. So that is perhaps, you know, we sing in order to attract mates. That argument is a bit discredited at the moment, I'd say, for humans for a number of reasons um, uh, that perhaps is not worth getting into for in full detail. Perhaps one reason why that might be a little bit suspect is often um, in bird species uh, that we do think evolved to sing for sexual selection, we see um, a kind of asymmetry uh, where like, for example, um, you know, the males learn to do all the singing and the like females like, you know, don't tend to do much singing. They just like listen and like learn to discriminate between the different songs. Um, but there's not really much evidence for, um, you know, sex asymmetries with regards to musical behavior and um, abilities in humans at all. Um, and that kind of, to some extent, weighs against that um, hypothesis. But then there's this whole question of like social bonding or this idea of credible signaling. Um, both kind of relate to this idea that music is some sort of special kind of social signal in some sense. Um, and I think there are some potentially, uh, you know, I, I, th I think the truth probably lies in some combination or like um, uh, of, of, of those kind of theories relating music to its kind of social role it plays. So, for example, in the credible signaling proposal, um, you know, we use music to kind of signal certain relationships we have with each other. So, for example, um, uh, in infant care practices, in child care practices, um, we may have, to some extent, evolved song-like abilities in the context of kind of singing to our uh, babies and uh, to kind of help regulate their emotions and to communicate like, you know, I'm socially here with you and, um, uh, and, and, and this kind of thing. Um, and potentially some of the dancing, dance-like rhythmic aspects of music might have, might have evolved in the context of kind of signaling sort of social cohesion and sort of group coordination um, abilities. Um, so that's that's a bit yeah. of the kind of credible signaling proposal. Um, yeah, you can argue was, that those are socialized, but it does it does seem like there's sort of this natural soothing element and and this picture of like a mother singing to her child. Yeah, I mean, and and certainly like if if we're to look at music generally, one of its kind of almost perhaps defining properties, although you know defining music's like kind of a bit of a slippery slope. Um, uh, you know, one of its key properties is that it's something that like emotionally engages us um, in important ways, right? So like, you know, um, people often listen to music in ways that help them regulate their emotions. Um, and, uh, you know, often, for example, in films or, you know, this sort of thing, like we often have music as this like, you know, so, uh, emotional enhancer sometimes to kind of like, you know, really draw out the emotional content of a scene. Um, so like, you know, music has a kind of 
a really powerful so, uh, emotional role to play. And um, perhaps at least some of the origins of that perhaps have to do with these like kind of relationship um, human adults have with infants and helping to control their emotions. Um, because one interesting thing about humans, right, compared to many other animals is that um, humans are ba basically born not self-reliant where we're kind of um we're, we're pretty useless for quite a number of years um where we're quite dependent on adults for like food and attention and kind of like all this care and everything like that um and there's ideas that um this might have been necessary in order to achieve our uh you know big brains relative to the rest of our body and our complex sort of um you know intelligence and social social reasoning abilities perhaps we traded off the ability to you know be born ready in the world um for uh you know this th these other abilities but at the cost of being kind of um uh quite useless <laughs> for a, quite a number of years uh -huh. um, the technical term for this is altruciality this idea that um you know humans are sort of quite altruistic in the sense that we're like born not ready for fending for ourselves and um so music might have been this thing that like helped control the baby's behavior and help regulate their emotions in our kind of pleistocene ancestors like a million years ago in you know africa or something right uh-huh yeah that, that's really cool I've, I've heard from others um bipedalism experts who talked about how how bipedalism led to you know the smaller birth canal and, and then humans are born prematurely and then those so that's combined with the larger brains but i hadn't um pieced in that that additional component of like because the babies are helpless we need this additional component of like bonding Right. And, and, it, and it's easy to forget that because in our modern world, like we have, you know, um, all these modern luxuries and well, I mean, some of us do um, uh, of, you know, let's say childcare and like all, all these other sorts of things. But of course, it's easy to forget that our ancestors like, you know, a million years ago um, would have been in potentially these small, relatively small social groups and have had a lot of other risks in the environment and um, all these other challenges in which like a crying baby that needs attention is potentially like a, a real risk to the um, group. So, you know, being able to help control their emotions and soothe them and kind of, um, you know, help build those initial social relationships with an infant might've been really important. Uh -huh. That reminds me of one of the, the early classic psych experiments. I think it was Harlow with the monkeys and there's, there's two sort of fake mothers and the monkeys are more likely to go to the cloth one that's like comforting to hold on to than than just a make one made of wire that actually has food. So that, that seems to suggest that keep that comfort to some extent is more important than, than than these basic necessities like food for for young babies. Yeah, absolutely. And I think like this idea of like building that social relationships quite important as well because I mean you know, really one of the things that defines humans relative to many other animals is our kind of especially complex social cognition abilities. Um, you know, we're such a especially cooperative and social species, even compared to many other animals that have social structures and such. Um, and, you know, there's growing evidence that much of this kind of starts to um, uh, come into place in like kind of the first years of life. Um, you know, and, and, and some of our first communicative interactions um, between adults and, uh, you know, babies at about, let's say, uh, one year old or so, are when, um, you know, adults and babies are trying to coordinate their tension together. So like, you know, having the, let's say, the mother saying, oh, like, look at that over there. And like, you know, trying to build this idea that like, you know, us together um, we're both looking at the same thing. We're both like kind of engaging together with this activity or context. Um, and maybe, uh, you know, this kind of musical like way of, um, you know, engaging might've been a, a key part of that. Uh -huh. um, right. There's the emotional component. And then there's this like cognitive engagement pattern recognition type thing. Cause there seems to be like a, a complexity sweet spot, spot for music because you don't want it to be too simple and monotonous. And then if it's too complex, it'll just sound chaotic. But then there's this this sort of middle ground um, that we seem to naturally gravitate towards. Yeah, and and right. So this is getting into this idea of like the aesthetics of music and like you know what people find attractive about music. And yeah, kind of like you're saying, um, there's this often. Uh, so sometimes it's described as an inverted U-shaped relationship where. Um, you know, like with many things, if it's like, you know, completely predictable and simple, um, 
you know, like, why, why are we paying attention to it? Like, we already know what's happening. It's like not very interesting. Um, but at the same time, if it's complete chaos, we can't predict anything about it. So, you know, it's, it's like, you know, looking at a, a, a screen full of like static or something like that. Um, but if we find this kind of sweet spot where, you know, there are predictable structures in, in the music, but there are some things that we can't predict that kind of motivate us to keep paying attention and to keep engaging with it. That's often this kind of the, the um, you know, the type of musical stimulus that engages people. Huh. So you know how some birds can mimic sounds very well, like a, a bird could mimic a car alarm. And for us, <laughs> that would just sound annoying, but the bird is doing it to show off like how good it is at mimicry. And it might actually be seen as attractive to like, it's a male bird doing this to attract female attention. Why is it that that would be seen as, as sort of this attractive show of skill? And then for us, the car alarm just sounds so annoying and it would also sound annoying when the bird is doing it. <laughs> Well, uh, yeah, I, I don't know if I have a good question for that necessarily, but, um, you know, like, who, who knows if we have any sort of evolved inclination for it, but I think, you know, people also find attractive or at least impressive when humans are able to, you know, do impressive things, you know, with their voice as well. Um, you know, that includes things like singing perhaps, but, um, mm -hmm. yeah, uh, like if you could mimic a jackhammer with your voice, it would be really impressive, but you'd probably want people to stop after like a, a few seconds. That, that, that's definitely true. And um, yeah, I, I guess this like kind of gets the idea that like humans do this thing of kind of curating the like sound environment, um, often mm -hmm. a lot more than other animals. Like for example, there are some experiments with, I can't remember exactly what form of non-human primate. There might be... Um, yeah, some sort of uh, monkey um, where, you know, for example, they um, have, yeah, these monkeys in some sort of enclosure where in one part of the enclosure, they have like, you know, let's say white noise or something that to humans would sound quite kind of like, you know, um, like that sound horrible. And like, you know, like you wouldn't want to spend much time in this place where like, you know, just white noise is playing loudly. Um, and uh, in another part of the enclosure, they have, you know, some form of music. Um, and, uh, you know, there's evidence from uh, some of these early studies. I think uh, Josh McDermott was one of the authors on this paper um, uh, and a few other people. Um, and, and basically what they showed is that like, you know, some of these um, uh, non-human primates, they, they didn't really have any sort of preference for, um, you know, being in the part of the enclosure that either has music or has like white noise. So, you know, there's arguably some aspects of our psychology that like, you know, lead us to finding some sound environments more aesthetically pleasing or, you know, pleasurable to be in than others. Um, and perhaps that's different to some other animals. Uh -huh. So we seem to be more or less as visual as other primates, Do you? Th but, but most other animals use smell a lot more than, than we did. Do you think as language evolved, we started paying more attention to like our, our audition and, and less for, for smell and there was like that trade off there? Yeah, I, I'm not sure if I've got anything too intelligent to comment about that. Like, I mean, one thing I would say is actually, I think there is some evidence that um, uh, that humans do have a somewhat reduced like visual sort of cognition capacity um, relative to some, um, you know, primates. Uh, in particular, for example, um, humans uh, tend to be fairly good at uh, perceiving kind of rhythm in the auditory domain. So like, you know, if I were to play you like a musical beat, like humans are quite good at perceiving that sort of temporal regularity. Whereas I think there's some evidence showing that um, uh, primates tend to, at least some sort of great ape species, show evidence of better um, temporal acuity in the visual domain than humans, but like far poorer in the auditory domain. So I think there are some differences there. Um, also, I think one interesting idea which has come up in recent research is the fact that humans, um, you know, we, we're not just given some innate brain from birth, but rather like our enculturation can affect our brain in interesting ways. So for example, humans learn to read. And um, one of the things that does is takes up part of our high level visual cortex that would have otherwise been dedicated to perceiving other things. So there's some really interesting work, um, for example, uh, involving the um, neuroscientist uh, Stanislas Tehen, um, who has you know, shown evidence uh, for this idea that as humans 
learn something like reading, which is a very complex visual activity, we actually trade off some ability to do well in other tasks, such as like, for example, face recognition. Um, wow. Does a similar thing happen with learning to read music? So that, then you're sort of um, integrating your, your, your vision and your hearing more than you might otherwise? Yeah, almost certainly. Like, um, there's far less research on this. Uh, there's one researcher in particular whose whose name I'm blanking on right now, who has done a bit of research on this, both both behaviorally and looking at the neuroscience of this. So, um, I, I think it's definitely a thing. Like any sort of like complex cultural visual system that we have to learn, that has to fit in our brain somewhere. Like we have to specialize some sort of brain circuit in order mm -hmm. to be able to process it well like we again we kind of take for granted the idea that we can read so effortlessly but you know uh -huh. to, uh, someone that doesn't know how to read like you know text is like you know incredibly complicated series of squiggles and swells that are kind of meaningless and hard to make sense of so we, we've had to kind of um uh develop in our brain like very specialized circuits for decoding these um visual patterns and yeah, absolutely the same thing would apply to learning to read music or something mm -hmm. Yeah, earlier you were mentioning pattern recognition. It seems like we're not we're on, we're not only very good at habituating, well, at recognizing patterns, but also habituating to them. But to the point that I remember hearing about um, one neuroscience study that it showed that not only if, if there's like a repeated tone that's played at some steady interval, not only will we habituate to it, and and you'll stop seeing the the neuronal firing. Um, mm -hmm when the tone plays, but then if it suddenly stops at the interval that you expect it to happen, suddenly you'll see a brain spike again. So it's like, we, we get so used to it that, so at first you're surprised when you hear it. And then suddenly, if you don't hear it when you're expecting to, you'll, you'll see that same surprise. Yeah. And I mean, like, um, this gets into like a, a pretty popular theoretical framework in sort of cognitive science and neuroscience recently, this idea of like predictive coding or like various related approaches and which is very much framing many aspects of our cognition in terms of how we make predictions about the world as a way of being able to process things well so instead of just passively letting whatever we perceive like come at us and process it as it comes to us we have all sorts of intelligent ways of making predictions about what we're likely to perceive and encounter and we can kind of adjust our actions accordingly and only like when when our predictions are violated we can adjust our predictions in light of that so mm -hmm. you know uh, there are these studies that kind of look at that in a very simple way in something like a tone experiment where you know we do play a repetitive stimulus that's easily predictable and when there's violations to that you know we see a clear brain response because that's our brain going oh this isn't what i predicted um mm -hmm. and again this gets back to this idea of people's um aesthetic preferences in music and for like kind of moderate amounts of complexity so again you know if if your brain is able to predict everything about what's coming it's not really very interesting and it's not really engaging the brain very much but if it's like you know this moderate amount of complexity where it's still able to make some predictions but it's kind of being violated sometimes then that really kind of engages us a lot more and we're mm -hmm. we've become quite you know um motivated uh -huh. You know, uh, robotic voices, not not like the newer fancy ones like Siri, but like really <laughs> old Microsoft Sam robotic sounding. Uh, so there, there's something interesting that I, I want about that. I wonder if it relates to this sort of statistical learning we're talking about, where it's like you can understand that voice, but it's kind of uncomfortable to listen to. And it seems to require more cognitive effort, like it, it flows less. Do you think that idea of flow is just that we become accustomed to certain sounds sounding a certain way. Yeah, I, I think that's definitely part of it. And actually, so there, there are some studies um, that have looked at, you know, uh, you know, c comparing like listening to ordinary speech versus like this incredibly robotic kind of um, type of synthesized speech in terms of like how we can comprehend these signals. Mm -hmm. um, and some of it does show that you know, we are kind of worse at um, comprehension when we are just listening to this like really robotic monotonous voice. Um, but I think actually like probably one of the most important aspects of that is often those like really crude uh, synthetic voices lack what's called prosody in speech. So like prosody is like, you can roughly think about it as like almost the music of speech. So it's like rhythmic and pitch mm -hmm. characteristics that we often kind of don't really pay attention too much it's kind of taken for granted but um uh 
you know, it turns out actually the rhythm of the way we speak and the kind of subtle pitch patterns in how we speak actually do a lot to help us comprehend things. And actually, so this was kind of related to my PhD work in which I looked at how um, certain rhythmic structures in how we speak uh, like help us comprehend certain kind of complex sentence structures where we need to hold certain information in memory as we're kind of listening to, um, you know, someone speak a sentence. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think thus far, when, when we've been talking about music, I've been thinking about like singing type music. We've been talking mm -hmm. a lot about language and about uh, how, how we process sounds and things like that. But what about, what about like music in the, in the instrumental sense where it's, it's not, it's, it's harder to make a, a clear evolutionary case for it because it, it would have evolved much later after we learned to like craft instruments rather than just do, do what we have um, with our bodies. Yeah, I mean, I, I think part of, yeah, like what, what you were saying there, like, I, I think it's a reasonable assumption, although it is an, as, an assumption that um, probably the kind of vocal song aspects of music um, kind of came first, although like, you know, some uh -huh. people do argue that like some of the more percussive aspects of um, music may have been a, a relatively early um, part of musical behavior. Mm -hmm. Um, and of course, we do have, you know, evidence of, for example, you know, bone flutes and such things that go back like uh -huh. roughly 50,000 years or so. Um, so we do know people have had um, musical instruments in at least some form for, um, you know, many thousands of years. Um, but then, you know, one thing I would say is we don't need an evolutionary explanation for like every aspect of our behavior mm -hmm. um, today. So it could be the case um, that perhaps whatever aspects of our music psychology are evolved, perhaps they originally just involved in perhaps a more singing-like mm -hmm. context. Um, and then, you know, all of the rich ways we engage with instrumental music today are kind of like, you know, mm -hmm. um, offshoots of that, a kind of auditory cheesecake, uh, as it were. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm imagining that singing and flutes and drumming and things like that are very natural, but then I'm trying to understand the auditory cheesecake of things like guitar and piano which sound very nice arguably sound nicer but i'm wondering what the what the connection is that of that would be like in our natural environment like is there anything out in nature that sounds like strings uh i mean so like a, again like my feeling here would be that like i don't think in any kind of coherent way we evolved to for example enjoy or like particularly play for example guitar specifically um mm -hmm. But, you know, one aspect of that is, um, uh, you know, in order to play guitar, and, and I know this as a guitarist, like, you know, we have to coordinate an incredibly complex and intricate, like, you know, series of movements with our fingers, right, mm -hmm. in order to um, do it. And, you know, um, we know that humans likely evolved... Um, you know, more complex forms of manual coordination, especially with our hands, potentially in the context of things like tool use and, and this sort of thing, like in, you know, in contexts that aren't really related to music. Um, so it's quite mm -hmm. possible that like the kind of complex abilities that we're able to exhibit in something like playing a guitar, perhaps those original abilities, perhaps involved in something quite different to music, perhaps like uh -huh. something use in which we had to coordinate um you know you know complex hand movements and and, and this sort of thing so mm -hmm. so we could we could slowly zoom in from from like so that the the evolutionary perspective would be i guess as broad as you could go more narrow than that would be sort of these cross-cultural universals um I, I wanted to ask you about some so it, it, it seems like there are probably some universal features to music cross-culturally any even in terms of the instruments we develop there, there seems to be guitar-like instruments across all cultures. And then maybe we could talk about that and then get into cultural specifics. Yeah, um, I guess, yeah. So there are a couple of different aspects of that. Um, I mean, with regards to similar instruments across cultures, um, you know, some aspect of this, again, doesn't necessarily need a biological evolutionary explanation. Mm -hmm. So for example, you know, um, the fact that we see percussive instruments, you know, pretty reliably across cultures um, may also be explained by merit of the fact that it's like a relatively technologically simple form of music making to, you know, culturally come up with. Um, like all you need is something to hit something else with, right? Um, so, so in that sense, um, 
you know, there doesn't really need to be any sort of biological specialization in order for a culture um, to be likely to develop percussive like instruments and perhaps mm -hmm. similar with guitar like instruments. Um, uh, I'm actually not familiar, like if people have done research on kind of the exact kind of, you know, genealogy, if you like, of like stringed instruments and that sort of thing. Um, uh, so, you know, it could be the case that there were some initial stringed instruments in a culture that sort of spread culturally and were passed on and kind of, you know, evolved uh, culturally in different cultures, like perhaps originating from a single culture, or perhaps people mm -hmm. from different cultures like did come up with their own stringed instruments completely independently from each other. Um, mm -hmm. But again, like, you know, for that, I wouldn't necessarily evoke any sort of biological evolutionary explanation, or at least uh -huh. not without any stronger motivation um, in order to explain something. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And then how about cross-cultural variation? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, this is a, a topic that uh, I engage with a fair bit, and especially the lab I'm part of, which again is um, the music lab. Um, so, so, so for example, uh, the director of the music lab, um, Samuel Muir, uh, he had this big paper a couple of years ago published in, in the journal Science um, titled uh, Universality and Diversity in Human Song. Um, and uh, so this was a big like collaborative paper that like in part tried to empirically um, really take seriously and explore this kind of relative balance of um, uh, universals and diversity in how people um, in, in kind of, you know, singing musical behavior like that, that paper kind of like, you know, for, for the sake of scope of the paper, didn't really necessarily look so much at instrumental music as its own thing. The focus was like, mm -hmm. especially on sung music. Um, and, um, you know, uh, one way they kind of, um, looked at this and I think it's a very productive way to look at it is to not just look at like the superficial aspects of music so say for example you know what sort of um you know acoustic characteristics happen to you know, happen in a given musical culture or something like that um but to look at the co-occurrence of form and function in different musical cultures so that is um you know humans don't just make music for no particular reason quite often we have a certain kind of functional role that music plays so for example um you know people often make music in order to support dancing or you know make music in order to help soothe a baby or like um mm -hmm. press love to another person in a love song you know all, all uh -huh. these sorts of things right um and then kind of what this paper did or one of the things it did it's a really huge paper with lots of different aspects to it um one of the things they did was uh looking at whether these kind of um functional contexts for music co-occurred with systematic um acoustic forms so for example like do we find not only do we find across cultures you know people uh dancing to music but is the kind of acoustic features that are associated with dancing are they always like kind of similar so for example um mm -hmm. uh you know do we often find uh you know greater rhythmic regularity do we find greater kind of accentuation of the rhythm um you know these kinds of um you know basic acoustic features we can find do they tend to co-occur with certain types of behavior um and long story short, this paper did find, um, you know, somewhat robust regularities in terms of these form function relationships um, across cultures, um, which, you know, helps motivate some of these like potentially evolutionary arguments that, um, you know, for instance, that like, you know, infant care practices might have been something important to how we evolved certain aspects of our musical psychology. Mm -hmm. um because again uh you know for example a lullaby has both a functional aspect you know you're helping to soothe the baby but then also there are certain acoustic features that reliably come up again and again across cultures kind of suggesting that like you know at least some of this might be um kind of grounded in our biology maybe not all uh -huh. of it but at least like you know some sort of seed that kind of helps um you know push different cultures in a similar direction do we know anything about why certain scales or, or certain patterns in, in music seem to evoke these different emotional responses? Um, so, well, so actually, so there, there was, there's a, there's a recent paper that came out a couple of days ago um, uh, from some uh, friends of mine um, 
uh, I think this is published in uh, the journal PLOS One, and the lead author, um, Alina Smith, and a few other colleagues like Roger Dean and Andrew Milne. Um, and for example, in this paper, one of the things that they do look at in terms of a cross-cultural question is that typically in like Western cultures, um, when we hear what's kind of referred to as major harmonies versus minor harmonies. So for example, um, <laughs> I can try and sing this to you, even though I'm a terrible singer. So, you know, for example, um, you know, do, re, mi, fa, so, do, mi, so. That's like kind of a major harmony, which we tend to associate with like happy emotions versus a minor harmony, like la, ti, do, re, mi, fa, do, mi is one note different, but we tend to associate that with more sad emotions. Um, and, you know, people have debated for centuries, if not millennia, about like, you know, are there kind of innate kind of reasons for why we associate certain, let's say, scale structures or harmonies with certain emotions? Um, and one interesting form of data that they provided um, was um, doing some experiments with a uh, relatively remote population in Papua New Guinea, um, in which they showed um, relatively little, if any, um, kind of uh, emotional association between these harmonic um, patterns and uh, the kind of harmonic or scale structure. Um, mm. But that's just one example. So like, ultimately, um, I do think there are some aspects of our biology that do ground the kind of emotional responses we tend to have. Um, mm. um, so you know, for example, uh, we share, I think, some uh, associations with sound with many other animals. So, for example, many animals have evolved vocal signaling repertoires that are important for signaling emotions between animals. So, for instance, um, often when an animal wants to be pro-social and friendly with other species, it tends to vocalize in a somewhat higher pitch. Um, but if it wants to be like, you know, aggressive or like, um, you know, standoffish or something in some way, it's often lower pitch and like harsher sounding um, uh, vocal qualities and such mm -hmm. things. Um, and you do see some of those um, kind of characteristics in uh, uh, musical emotional responses as well. Um, and actually, we sort of investigated some of those kinds of relationships in, in uh, a recent paper um, that I've been involved in that's looked at like this idea of infant directed vocalizations. Um, so, uh, yeah, so in, in this recent paper um, that which we have like coming out like, uh, like any day now in the journal uh, Nature Human Behavior, um, uh, uh, the paper is titled, um, uh, what's it titled? Uh, Acoustic Regularities in Infant Directed Speech and Song Across Cultures. So like one of the things we look at in this paper is um, the idea of infant directed vocalizations and whether they're cross-culturally attested. Um, and infant directed vocalizations, again, are really important emotionally um, for mm -hmm. infants. Um, so that's you mean like how a mother could tell if, if a cry from an infant is like hungry or angry or happy or whatever? Not so much that, but more in terms of, so um, to give you an example, uh, what I mean by infant directed vocalizations. So like if, if you had a, um, a baby in front of you that was being a bit fussy or like crying or something like that, right? Um, you know, we, we often kind of speak to babies, even though like we know they don't really understand our language. Um, but one of the things we tend to also do is like modify the acoustics of our voice when we speak to babies. Um, so, you know, often like, oh, hello, oh, you're sweet, no, don't oh, cry. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like this kind of like baby voice, right? Um, and essentially in, the, in this paper, we we're really interested in whether that kind of acoustic modification is something that's attested across cultures um, or whether it's just like an arbitrary cultural um, kind of thing that we've just happened to uh, evolve. Um, and, uh, you know, like what we did in order to do this, so that there has been previous research on this, but it's been largely on urban Western societies. And there's a few smaller scale society studies. Um, for example, there's some great work from uh, Tanya Brush and um, uh, Gregory Bryant, among others, that have looked at a few small scale societies. Um, but on the whole, like I'd say there's kind of like inconclusive evidence about like whether these kinds of acoustic modifications and also song modifications. So for example, like are the acoustics of lullabies stereotyped? Um, there's kind of inconclusive evidence about that. So 
in this study, we recruited like a kind of a crazy number of collaborators. There's almost like 40 co-authors on this paper. Um, uh, and um, many of, of, of these authors were anthropologists or like, you know, some sort of people with a specialized relationship with certain communities. And we made recordings of um, 410 people from 21 different cultures around the world, um, mm -hmm. uh, including, you know, um, societies in, you know, both North America, so like, you know, urban Western societies, but also, for example, um, small scale societies in a number of different places around the world, including, you know, Africa and Asia um, and South America um, and Oceania. Um, and um, for each of these 410 people that we made recordings of, we sort of got them to both speak to an infant and speak to an adult um, and sing to an infant and sing to an adult. And that way we could like see within each person whether they tend to modify their voice in certain ways and whether that's like done in a similar way across cultures. Um, and, you know, to cut a long story short, we, we did find that there were, um, you know, certain robust uh, modifications that people do there's certainly variation in that so for example um one of the most robust acoustic correlates of infant directed speech is that higher pitch component so people tend to speak in a higher and more variable pitch um and that's pretty reliable like we see evidence for that in all 21 of those societies we we looked at um but you know some societies do that a lot and some very little um so, you know, there's always like both like some aspects of universals and some aspects of variation. And, and that's kind of like what we observed there. Uh -huh. um, and I think that's like potentially really important in understanding like, you know, um, that kind of emotional communication in, in humans and those early social relationships and how we use, uh, you know, vocalizations um, uh, to support that. Mm -hmm. Right. That, that especially paired with what you mentioned about how with many animals, they'll use higher pitch if they're trying to be exactly. friendly. Uh, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. And one, one uh, just like further interesting thing about that. So um, one of the things actually I find really interesting in, um, in our study and one of the kind of unique things about recording both speech and song within the same people is we're able to compare between speech and song. So um, one of the interesting observations is that on average, infant directed when when you're speaking towards an infant you raise your pitch level to a level that's comparable to song generally so that is when we're singing mm -hmm. we tend to sing in a higher pitch than we typically speak mm -hmm. obviously like you know pitch varies all sorts of places but on average like our singing voice is higher in pitch than our speaking voice but when we um uh speak to infants we also speak in that higher pitch register that's very comparable to a song and right. among other kind of pieces of evidence in this paper it kind of helps substantiate the idea that infant directed speaking maybe has this special relationship to song maybe it's like a proto song that like perhaps our you know original um you know ancestors a million years ago like some aspects of singing may have like evolved in the context of like this kind of emotional vocalization to help control infants behavior and their emotions so um yeah like i, I think it's really interesting relationship between speech and song um, uh -huh. yeah that, that's a great way of looking at it especially because it seems to make our regular speech as this sort of neutral baseline from which you could either go up towards some more song-like tone to 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 be positive or like you know if, if you're yelling at your dog who just did something naughty or something you'll go in, a, in like a deeper voice and try and intimidate them totally yeah yeah cool um so it, it sounds like that was uh, a long road to get this paper out so congratulations on that uh, yeah what, and what's currently in the works and and stuff you have planned for the future yeah so we've got a number of things kind of in the works um and actually, so like our lab currently is in like a stage of transition. So like we're, we're currently, uh, you know, still based in um, the Department of Psychology at Harvard, but actually as of next month, um, we're transitioning to a kind of relationship between two institutions. Uh, the lab's going to be both based at um, Haskins Laboratories at Yale and at the University of Auckland in New Zealand, which will be fun. Mm -hmm. um, wow. But in terms of the work we're going to be doing, um, we have a number of uh, interesting things lined up. One of those things kind of builds on this infant-directed vocalization um, interest. So for example, uh, we have one study kind of testing the idea that like, okay, if um, you know, singing to your baby does help regulate their emotions, that's like, you know, likely to help um, 
you know, control their behavior and make like parenting and this sort of thing more enjoyable. So um, we're conducting this kind of longitudinal study where we're tracking parents over, you know, um, you know, uh, what is it like about three or four weeks, I guess, um, sorry, three or four months, um, where we're kind of encouraging them to, um, you know, sing to their baby or not sing to their baby in certain kind of sections of the study and tracking over the course of like these months, um, you know, how often the baby's like, you know, crying, how often are they distressed? Like, what are your emotional kind of, um, you know, what's your emotional state like, you know, because if, if your baby's crying less, you're, up, like, you're likely to be uh, in a better mood yourself. So um, yeah, long story short, we have a study kind of investigating the practical reality of like, you know, if singing to babies is a beneficial thing to do, we should be able to measure right. that. So is, is the hypothesis that maybe in the no sing group, there's more crying and more stress and in the singing group, less crying, less stress? Yeah, more or less. Although like, so um, we kind of stagger the kind of groupings so that like each participant does both a no singing and singing section themselves. Um, so mm -hmm. we don't entirely, you know, separate that out per person. Um, yeah, so that that's one study. Uh, then we have a whole bunch of studies lined up as well, doing more cross-cultural work, um, kind of understanding basic kind of facts about how people perceive, um, you know, the basic structures of music in cross-culturally uh, cross diverse music. Um, so, for example, uh, in that paper I mentioned earlier, um, the Universality and Diversity in Human Song paper, one big part of that paper was this corpus of audio recordings um, uh, called the Natural History uh, of Song Discography, which contained 118 uh, song recordings, um, you know, that are from relatively representative societies around the world. Um, one project we're currently trying to finish up is expanding that corpus of audio recordings from uh, 118 audio recordings to uh, what's probably going to end up being around 1500 audio recordings. Um, wow. So yeah, we're hoping to do a lot more interesting stuff with with that, and um, yeah, more interesting questions about sort of cross cultural differences and um, commonalities in terms of how people produce and mm -hmm. perceive music. That's all very exciting. I look forward to seeing what comes out of it. Yeah, well, you know, so do I. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank you so much for your time, uh, Courtney. This was very interesting. Oh, it's a pleasure. Yeah, no problem.